task is to create something out of nothing, as, as the coordinator just mentioned. So thanks for having me here. Let me begin with a question. How often has it happened that my brain tells me I need a pizza to quench my, my desire or whatever? And something here tells me, no, it's got to be a sandwich. Pizza, sandwich, pizza, sandwich. And who wins? Do you have a pizza or do you have a sandwich? In your living have a pizza. Why? Because pizza is scripted here. This thing doesn't, doesn't give it in black and white. It doesn't give it in writing that it's got to be a sandwich. And that's where the issue is. So, I'm going to talk about microbiome. Microbiome, what exactly is it? And I'll spend a few minutes on how it can change our lives and how it's only changing our lives actually. So it's those small lovely bacteria which live with us, live inside us, live on us, on our skins, <clears throat> in our hair, in our teeth, in the, in the gums. So this is what the, the conundrum is. Where is the brain? The brain is here or the brain is here. If you look at the early organisms, millions, millions of years ago, these organisms didn't have a brain. All that they had was a digestive tract. So the main purpose was how to survive. You get the food, you digest the food, you're happy, you're alive. As we evolved, as we evolved from crawling to walking, we realized that this is probably more important. And this began to take, play a more role, a bigger role in our day-to-day -day activities. So this has become the brain one, but actually this is the brain two. The brain one still resides in our gut which is unfortunately forgotten and relegated to the second brain position. So actually, this is brain one, this is brain two, and then we listen to the brain two more often, and that's when we move intuitively, we gravitate towards pizza than the sandwich. And that's when we are becoming what we eat. If you've seen the, the famous Texas burger, one burger, this much heat, one on layers and layers, it's around 4,800 calories, which is good enough for somebody like my size, my point size body, to survive for three days. And that's one meal for the average American who lives in Texas. The Texas Super Burger, 4,800 calories. So this is, it's a busy slide, but I want to spend some time on this. What exactly is a microbiome? It's the, the number of bacteria, viruses, fungi, everything put together, which reside in our tummy mainly. Tummy means the whole of intestines, the digestive tract, and of course, our skins. There are about 100 trillion of these small bugs, which live in a close symbiotic relation with all of us. Together, put together, they weigh around two kilos. So that means we are around 50 people here, two kilos per person, so we are actually having an invisible person sitting here right now in this auditorium who is controlling our moods to some extent, who is controlling our what I'm going to be eating today, how I'm going to be hearing, how jittery I am right now, how many butterflies I have inside my tummy. All of this is to some extent being regulated by these two kilos of bugs. In harmonious uh, symbiotic relation with all of us. 95% of these bugs are in the tummy. So tummy plays a major role in being uh, able to control our moods and, and our behaviors. The genes in the tummy, in these bugs, outnumber our human genes by a ratio of 150 is to one. Showing that if this is a human body, 90% of our genes, the human genes, the, the genes which we inherit from our parents, are unique to us, but that makes us 90% similar to each other. This is the microbiome genes in our body, which makes us vastly different from each other. And that's why I have two daughters, similar kind of genes. One feels cold at a temperature of 24. The other feels absolutely hot at a temperature of 24 at home. So we are at a constant hustle at home. Who wants to adjust the easy? Is it the bugs? 
I didn't give them these bugs, I just gave them the genes. They have acquired these bugs over the years because of human interactions, because of the environment that they lived in. And the Cambridge High School has contributed to that environment as well. Because of human interactions as well, and that's how we evolve. That's what makes our human biome so very really unique. And that's why you are you and I am I. And that's beyond the genes, beyond the genes which we have inherited. The viruses and bacteria, viruses outnumber the bacteria, and they are still beginning to unravel what each of these viruses could do. Bacteria, of course, they have learned to understand that they could do a lot more things than what is visible on the surface. 10,000 more and more and counting number of species of these bugs reside within us. So, I remember when I had graduated in the year 2000, there was an article in New England Journal of Medicine, one of the very respected journals of medicine, it said that, please sneeze on my child. This was an editorial actually, and it was written by a pediatrician, and we do have a pediatrician in England, I'm sure you will remember this. So the concept was, hygiene hypothesis is not so good. We need to get our kids, and we need to, including all of us, we need to expose ourselves to all these parts in order to build up our immunity. And that's why the concept was, please sneeze on the child so that my child develops these immunities and is able to withstand all the bugs in order to have a healthy life. The problem with most of us has been over the last decades is that we are focused on the bad bugs. We have never focused on the good ones. Because medicine has always been about treating a disease. Now we are having the concept of preventing a disease. How can we prevent? And how can we use these bugs to our advantage? So the microbiome is supposed to have impact on the nutrition. You will be amazed, without these gut bugs, it would be impossible for me to digest that pizza. The gut doesn't want it. My brain pushes the pizza down this road. But then 30% of the digestion is done by these bugs, that two kilo of bugs. Without them, I would be at a loss to get the energy to move on to the next meal. They have a huge impact on the immunity. That's where the hygiene hypothesis comes, that please sneeze on my child. Because the more diverse the exposure is, the less we are prone for autoimmune conditions, and better we are equipped to deal with all the infections. A whole variety of intestinal disorders, including bowel cancers, could be mediated by either an abundance or a lack of specific bacteria. So when the ratio gets haywire, we are prone to get these disorders. Obesity, this is the, the, the buzzword in today's, today's uh, world. Interestingly, two people, even twins, identical twins, if they eat the similar kind of food, the amount or the ability to extract energy out of that particular food differs from person to person. And that's mainly driven by the microbiome, including the identical twins. And that's because they have been exposed to different kinds of bugs, bacteria. They have a different microbiome. My microbiome is different than yours, which is just my microbiome is different than my daughter's. Yes, we will have similarities, but then we are not the same. We will never be the same. The impact on diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2 diabetes, both of them can be hugely impacted by the individual microbiomes in our systems. And of course, moods. The previous speakers touched upon the, the, the concept that Mr. Ian was very, very vociferous in talking about gratitude. Yes, after reading through all these and over the last years, last few years, the knowledge gained, I wake up in the morning now and I thank my tummy for guiding me towards that, the loop where I poop and I feel good. And that's that's a very, very liberating feeling that there is somebody with me who's doing the work, which otherwise I would, be have to, I would have to do at a very conscious level. Things happen at a subconscious level. And thank you to all, thanks to all these books, which, which make my life a lot easier. So we are moving towards an era where we are comparing the diet, how we can modify the parts of the microbiome in our systems. I cannot change my genes. If you ask me today, Dr. Ravi, can you get taller by a few inches? No. I can only get thicker. I can't get taller anymore. But I can modify the microbiome. 
which is 90% of what I am actually. So if we have a diet which is rich in fresh fruits, vegetables, less processed food, I go more towards symbiosis, where the, the gut bugs are in, are in sync, or in how many of my needs are by my system, and whereas if I eat more of meats and processed foods, and including the breads, the ubiquitous breads, which are there all over the world, I move towards this biosis, thereby potentially attracting more diseases and morbidity, not just mortality. We're talking of sickness, which is potentially preventable. And that's how we have come to the concept of fecal microbiota or fecal microbial transplants, FMT. How do you transplant? This, this is already in vogue for the last few years. The first fecal medical, the fecal transplants were, were done in the 1950s. And now it's an established treatment for something called as recurrent or resistant Clostridium difficile infection. That bug is hard to eradicate. We do see it even in our town, we do see it in our hospitals. But we don't have an FMT transplant program anywhere in this part of the world. But yes, the future is beckoning to that. So beyond the yucky factor, let me, let me tell you, how do you introduce, how do you transplant feces from a healthy donor to a disease, diseased or a sick person? How do you do that? First of all, it has to be connected. It has to be processed. How do you put it in? It could be either through something called an enema, lower down, the abhorrent end, or it could be through a tube through the mouth. Nobody wants a taste, I'm sure. It, it could be through a tube going down to the tummy, and probably under anesthesia, or it could be through endoscopy. All these are invasive procedures. So now, medicine has evolved to a stage where we want to make life easy. We take the stones from healthy donors, we freeze dry it, we extract the healthy bacteria, dry them, freeze them, put them in a capsule, and that's how you have poop in the pen. Four capsules morning, four capsules evening, and next day I shake them. Excuse me, but then that's exactly what the reality is going to be. And actually, I'm looking forward to the future. I'm really looking forward to the future where I hope I can enroll in one such program and I can be a healthy donor because I don't want to waste 100 dirhams twice a day just flush it down the drain, but I could be earning money out of it if I'm a healthy donor. So, probably five years down the line, you might see me coming in a Rolls Royce to the chemist to give a talk that yes, I'm a healthy donor and this is what I'm doing. The, the issue is slightly beyond that. We are now moving towards an era where we want to encourage people to think of one health. That means the health of myself, my colleagues, my environment, the animals which made my, my world, the plants, the marine life. Because if everybody's health is taken together, we all move towards a healthy, healthy environment for everybody, everybody's health improves. That's a new concept of one health. And that's how we are having the World Microbiome Day on 27th of June. I might be giving this talk again around June. But then that's, that's where we are evolving. And thank you so much for your patient hearing. I hope you all have a healthy sandwich laden day. And you all have a, have a healthy outcome tomorrow morning. <laughs>